Baruch Hashem. We're back with part two of our learning. Again, we are learning today on March 12th of 2021. This is part two. We're learning from the Siddur. Today we're learning, um, the title is Nissan Blessings, Gratitude, and Emptying Our Pockets for Pesach. We have already gone over, I just wanted to kind of unload my heart, give a class kind of background, um, talked about the Seder, talked about some practical and spiritual ways of connecting to that, just from some experiences I have had. We talked about um, just, just some very beautiful concepts about God being the God who will exceed our expectations if we will just wait on Him. And then we... Um, we started learning about the month of Nissan, which we are now in. So, well, we're not now in, sorry. This coming weekend will, Saturday night sundown, will begin the new month. So we just read about some different things. It's called the first month. It is the first month on the biblical calendar. Um, God says this will be for you the first of the months. And um, it's known as Aviv, which means spring. Um, Nissan, there's, uh, and, and then we, we just finished talking about how in real time, as we're reading about the tabernacle and Mishkan on the Torah cycle, the tabernacle, the Mishkan was erected on the first of Nissan in real time. So that's what we just finished doing. So we're going to continue on here. Years later, the first of Nisan was when the Jews of the Babylonian exile began to return to Israel. The buds had begun, begun to blossom. Um, Nisan is a time when Jews make a special blessing over new blossoms. Upon the first sighting of the new blossom of fruit trees at the start of the spring, the following blessing is recited. So I have it over here, and it's actually the... the um, Talmud teaches this. So Tractate Barakot 43b, Rabbi uh, Yehuda said... It just signed up off for some reason. Not sure why. I'm going to start WebEx again for the live feeders and for my, for my other recording. Not sure what happened. It's just probably my computer. Computer. They said they were having trouble, but I have a feeling it might be me. Sorry, I don't know um, if it's on my end, but just keep this off. Okay, just kidding. Oh yeah, Marina's there. Good. Yeah. All right. Hopefully, Rebecca and Pam will be able to try again. I'm gonna try and just message them real quick. I forgot Pam, but let me try Rebecca. See, this is the fun part. <laughs> of online. It usually doesn't do quite like this. Like it, it's either terrible and then it just doesn't work at all, or it works just fine, or it's weird like this. Oh my gosh. Yeah. You put so much effort into this, and this is beautiful. Thank you so much. I hope you know how much we appreciate it. Thank you. I'm, I'm, 
that's why you do it. He blesses me too. Okay. All right, I've got, yeah, it's my, it's my email. Okay, let's see. Where's Rebecca? Which one is Rebecca? No. Hi, sorry. I, uh, it was on my end this time. Oh, okay. I believe. So we're back. This is good. Um, we'll just go ahead and get started. If Rebecca is able to to get back on, that will be good. Okay. But I'm sorry. We'll just go ahead and pick back up. I was about to read this blessing. Let me let me start this recording also, just in case. So I was about to read the blessing for the months of Nisan, where the Jewish people will bless over the new blossoms upon the first sighting. Um, of blossoms on the fruit trees at the start of the spring. So Tractate Brachot 43b, Rabbi Yehuda said, a person who goes out in the month of Nisan and sees trees bloom should recite this blessing. Brachot Ha-Yinot. Blessed are you who did not leave anything lacking in this world, created a good, created a good creations and wonderful trees for humans to benefit from. Beautiful little blessing to be said. All right, continuing on. When 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 one goes out in the beginning of spring, in the beginning of spring, they may see beautiful flowers about to sprout or trees soon to blossom. They likely observe the beginnings of grass that is about to grow or the first buds in a raised garden. All of these, of course, are the signs of the season of Aviv spring. However, if one looks outside using the glasses of the month of Nisan, then they would perceive a whole different picture. You see, the month of Nisan is known in Judaism as Zaman Geula Tenu, the time of our redemption. It is the month that we celebrate these miracles of the past and dream about the miracles of the future. The month of Nisan is filled with miracles, with the splitting of the Sea of Reeds, as well as the Jordan River at the time of Joshua, Listen to all this. This is really amazing. All these things. So the time of the splitting of the sea and the Jordan River at the time of Joshua, along with the walls of Jericho tumbling down. In the month of Nisan, we witnessed heroism, including the fall of Masada and the Warsaw Ghetto uprising. In the month of Nisan, we as people witnessed God's presence brought into this world with the erection of the tabernacle. We felt euphoria as a nation via the Exodus. We felt national tragedy through the untimely death of our own sons, Nadav and Avihu. In this historical month, we witnessed justice as the Eichmann trial began, and we were instilled with a sense of hope and with the birth of the miracle child, Isaac Yitzhak, born to his elderly parents, Avram and Sarah. In this month, our hope was restored with a proclamation by Napoleon in 1799 that the Jews can establish a Jewish state. In the month of Nisan, we felt the horrors of slavery through our time in Egypt and through the ceiling of the Lodz Ghetto, the first ghetto of its kind in the Holocaust. In this month of redemption, we also tasted the sensation of freedom both through the Exodus as well as the liberation of Buchenwald on April 11, 1945. In this majestic month, we are given the taste of peace through the Camp David Accords and felt the warmth of God's eternal covenant through the beat. Brit Bain Habetarim, the covenant of the parts or the covenant of the pieces with Abraham. All these things are corresponding to this month. It's a packed month. I mean, they all are, but really, wow. If you go outside in the spring, you may see the blossoms, the buds, and the blossoms. But if you see the world through the prism of Jewish history and go outside in the month of Nisan, you can see something altogether different. You can see God. And when you are able to clearly to see God as clearly as we can see this month of miracles, you can make that special blessing that begins. Blessed are you who did not leave anything lacking in this world. As we enter this month of miracles and redemption, Rabbi Soloveitchik reminds us that the concept of time for our people is not linear. When we have our sederim, the seder, seder meals, in the middle of this special month, we too experience the same exodus that our forefathers did 3,300 plus years ago. For Jews, the events that occurred in our history are timeless 
and part and parcel of whom we are. That's what is meant. Um, that's what it means to look at the world through the glasses of Jewish history. And when we do that, all things become way more significant and meaningful. So if you, even if you go to Chabad.org, they have a Jewish calendar. And if you go to the day, it'll say on this date, and it'll have a whole write-up of things historically that happened on that day, and then biblically as well. It's a great tool. Our sages tell us that the miracles of Passover will pale in comparison to the miracles of the Messianic times. These miracles have already begun, as we have observed the unfathomable with the resurrection of the Jewish homeland in Israel after 2,000 years. We are like dreamers in the return to Zion. As we are standing in the middle of what we understand to be the beginning of our sprouting of our redemption. This Nisan, may we complete the process of redemption and witness miracles and wonders for our people like never seen before. Amen. And that was by Rabbi Ira Eppen. So, I should have grayed, put this in gray. So, we are about to enter into the month of Nisan. It'll be sundown, Saturday evening. Blow the shofar after Havdalah. And Havdalah is a service you do to to say hello to the new week and say goodbye to the Holy Sabbath. Nisan is the first of months for the Jewish people. It is the beginning, the new year on the biblical calendar. Its name is related to the Hebrew word for standard, as in banner or miracle, ness, in plural, nisayon. You can hear it, nisan, nisayon, miracles. And indeed, this was and is, and, and so may it be is, a month of miracles for the people of Hashem. And so, Pam, if you'll read that verse for us, please. You'll have to unmute. Okay. Yeshayahu, Isaiah eleven eleven. Then it will happen on that day, the Lord will again recover the second time with his hand the remnant of his people who will remain from Assyria, Egypt, Hathros, Cush, Elam, Shinar, Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. And he will lift up a standard for the nations and assemble the banished ones of Israel and will gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. And they have that in there just to show you an example of this word nest. And this is a wonderful thing, that um, context of the ingathering. And it has everything to do with the redemption and he's gathering together all his people from the four corners of the earth. So, as we have done for previous Rosh Kodashim, for the previous new months, we will study the Tehina. And Tehina prayers are particular additional blessings that are said for women, by women, um, which contain the voice of the past as well as the connection to what these women concerned themselves with at particular times. Through these prayers written in an intimate voice between Hashem and his daughters, we can attempt to grasp the past and bring it into our future, preserving and appreciating even that which might seem foreign to us in this modern age, for Rosh Kodesh Nisan. So that's what we're going to do from our Siddur, Siddur learning today, and, the, and we're going to begin that now. So the Tehina prayer for Rosh Kodesh Nisan begins, and it reads as follows to start. God, the all-merciful Father, who does greatness beyond understanding and miracles and wonders without measure, we come now to bless and sanctify the month of Nisan, in which month, dear God, you did many miracles and great wonders for us. Bless this month that we merit to be redeemed from all oppression. If this, Lord, is the season of our redemption, I want to know what that means. Webster's Dictionary gives these following definitions for the English word redeem. To buy back, repurchase, to get or win back, to free from what distresses or harms, to free from captivity by payment of ransom, to extricate from or help to overcome something detrimental, to release from blame or debt, clear, to free from the consequences of sin, to change for the better, reform, repair, restore, to remove the obligation of payment, 
to exchange for something of value, to make good, fulfill, to atone for, expiate, redeem an error, to offset the bad effect of, to make worthwhile or retrieve. And then there's a verse there. You want to read it? I don't know. Let's see. You're going to too far. Let's see where we're at. Um, yeah, that was super small. I don't know. Do you want to read mine? It's a little um, bigger. Can you see it? No. Okay. okay. Do you want this? Um, Can you see that one? At the top? Yeah. Therefore, the sons of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you from out under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from their bondage. I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. Yeah. Sorry, it's so small. I'll try and make it bigger next time. So yeah, so this beautiful verse, this is what he says to us, that he's going to deliver us from our bondage and also redeem us. So we hear it all the time, waiting for the Geula, for the redemption, the Messiah, the restoration of all things. I want to deeply grasp what it means, redeemed, the redemption. It is yet to come, and yet it is already then and yet also it is happening right now how because i believed that you lord will stop at nothing to win to get me back when i have strayed from your ways or from my destiny ordained by you from the moment that you began to weave me together in my mother's womb because i believe that whatever challenge or god forbid detrimental situation i may come face to face with that you will help me from within that place not remotely, directly extricating me for no temptation is overtaking you, such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. From 1 Corinthians 10.13 I believe that redemption is right now, because I know that, because it is your will, I can change for the better. I can live a life of reform from the hamets, the puffed up places of illusory pomp, which have clung to the corners of my hard to reach darkened places inside. I believe that you can repair and restore the places within me that are dysfunctional and paralyzed from fear, doubt, shame, and trauma. I believe all this because you made the purchase, because you have exchanged something of the highest value for my life. Not so that I can live this life the way that pleases me. No, I have been bought by the blood of the Pesach sacrifice, Messiah Yeshua, because you thought that my life was and is that worthwhile. So I believe it too. I have no other choice. For not to believe in myself means I don't believe that his suffering was worthwhile. He didn't do that for some loser, some worthless some unfortunate, useless, futile soul. He did that for me. He did that for you, for me, for you, and right now. And and for the you and the me that we're continuing to become redeemed. So the Tehina for Rosh Chodesh Nisan continues reading, Just as you redeemed your nation Israel from Egypt and split the sea for them, and the Jews sang to you, so too, Master of the universe, redeem us so that we can sing to you of the miracles and wonders that you will do with us. May we indeed sing a new song to you. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord, so may it be that through our lives your name will be known through Messiah in us and that light of divinity. Let us choose that identity as our banner. What a miracle it is when human beings are moved Move to repentance, move to fidelity, move to choose light over dark and the holy instead of the profane, to love instead of to harm, to be kind instead of correct. Um, And I'm going to read this psalm. It's one of the psalms of ascent. Um, Shir HaMalot, from Tehillim, Psalm 130. Nima Amakim Karatecha Hashem. 
Out of the depths I have cried to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? For with you is forgiveness, that you may be feared. I put my confidence in Hashem. My soul put confidence, and I hoped for your my soul yearns for the Lord, like those longing for the dawn, those longing for the dawn, let Israel hope in Hashem, for with Hashem is kindness. And with him is abundant redemption. And he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. And then I wanted to share this here. The 15-step method. In the temple days, the spiritual pilgrimage reached its climax at the 15 stairs leading up to the Holy of Holies. On these steps, the musicians of the tribe of Levi played and sang Shir Hamalot, the Song of the Steps. Reaching a spiritually worthwhile destination, it requires a process, an effort to achieve new heights. One cannot expect to sense the power of the Seder without strenuous preparations beforehand. May our intensive cleaning purify us and prepare us for a personal journey down into Egypt, and back up to freedom. The Tekhina for Rosh Kodesh Nisan continues, reading, Open your eyes and see, dear God, with what effort your dear nation observes your commandments, which you commanded them to do in this month of Nisan, to clean out the leaven from their house and to eat matzos all seven days of Pesach. Simple. Matzah is simple. Two ingredients baked at an extremely high heat, pierced so that all air can escape, all pride and wind baggedness, the part of us that loves hearing the sound of our own voice, forgive me for hearing the sound of my own voice so much today, so that we can finally remain open to what Hashem has to say, what the other others around us need for us to hear. Um... Yay, Sam is back. I'm so glad you signed back on, Sam. Um, if you want to go to where we're at, we, we're at, we're starting to read the Tahina prayer for Rosh Kodesh Nisan. We just did a bunch of learning on Nisan, which you can go back and do, or you probably already know. We're just down from where it's in bold, the 15-step method. We just sang one of the songs of ascent and talked about the that being kind of the climax and how our spiritual journey it takes steps and it takes planning. And so um, we were continuing on with that. And now we're just reading about matzah. And again, if we can be like unto the matzah, this is what we want to be. Simple, just two ingredients. And yes, to make it what it is, sim simple but so valuable, you're baked at an extremely high heat. You're pierced so that all that pride can get out of you. And, and obviously... Many people have corresponded the matzah with the bruises and the the texture and the piercings and the way that it was broken to Yeshua as that Pesach offering. And so the Seder begins by breaking the matzah in two and explaining that this is the bread of poverty and persecution. Of three matzo, two remaining whole in order to symbolize the abundance of freedom, but one must be broken one must be broken to recall deprivation and slavery. In the midst of the Seder banquet, the broken matzah is meant to jar us out of the sense of complacency. And this is from my A Different Night Haggadah. It doesn't take long to visualize how the crack of that center matzah at Yeshua's Seder would have echoed in the room where the apostles reclined with him. 
how much more so his words. And if Sam, you're able, you want to read that for us? Yes. <clears throat> and when he had taken matzah, bread, and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So can you can you picture that? I mean, it being this night before he is to suffer the most anguish that any human could could endure, and he knew that it was coming. And there's this whole build up to the seder. He has his apostles prepare it all, get it all ready. Just can you imagine him at that point, just cracking that matzah and explaining? what it meant. I think it would have made a big impression. So when you come to that point, this is a point at which I hope to ask my husband to draw more attention to this year, pay attention to that and really internalize that and let that kind of be like, maybe like a, like an ish, and like it said, to jar, jar us to the real uh, weight of and value of being broken and his brokenness for us. So I want to show you now a Hebrew, some of the Hebrew. So this is the word, because the way yours printed, what I'm reading is here. But oh, if you okay. want to look there um, and follow along, then I'll show you where we're at too, okay. whichever you want. So I've got, and I don't remember how it was on the blog, but I know I put, so I've got this lexicon page. Bread of affliction, right? So this is a word oni or ani. I wanted to look at that word. Um... So we have, I'll just skim through the context. We have, again, on, on, ani, um, affliction or misery. We have, this is a complete list. Okay, this is the only places it's found in all of the Torah. And as I suggested, studying the Hebrew, sometimes, not always, sometimes when there are so few and they're in such poignant places, it's almost a story and there's somehow a connection between all of these things. So we have Hagar, my kind of my kindred spirit of this year's Torah cycle. Um, again, who I have not appreciated until this year. We have Hagar and she calls him the Lord who sees me because he, and the angel's telling her, I, the Lord has given heed to your affliction. We have Leah and she is, um, having her first son and seeing that the Lord has given her a son. And she says that the Lord has seen my affliction. Surely my, my husband will love me. And, um, then we have, um, so Jacob talking to Laban basically, and he is leaving his bondage situation. And he's saying, that God had seen my affliction in the toil of my hands and he rendered judgment last night on my behalf. Um, we have Yosef's sons. You can see the congruency to the themes if you think about it a little deeper. Ephraim is born because God made me fruitful. His name, Peri, fruit Ephraim, in the land of my affliction. And then we have our Egypt context. The Lord has seen the affliction of the people in Egypt. He said, I'm going to bring you up out of the affliction. And then we have um, the people believing and because God had seen their affliction. And then there's none in Leviticus, none in the book of Numbers. But then we go all the way to the end in Devarim, the book, the last book of the Torah. And what do we have? The Passover that you're going to eat this bread of affliction and so that you may remember all the days of your life, the day when he came out of the land of Egypt. And then again, when we cried to the Lord, the God of our fathers, the Lord heard and saw our voice and saw our affliction and our toil and our oppression. So I'll just give you the clue in to what I'm about to read here. You can see that I have highlighted in the yellow. Everywhere there's a word affliction. God is active. He's seeing. He's right there. So, so now I'll go on with the commentary on this. The this word affliction, this matza of affliction. What is this word? This Hebrew term is ani, misery or affliction. 
To the left it says, but whichever way it is on your page, is a complete list of all the times this masculine noun form of the word ani is found in the Torah. It is a beautiful telling list of contexts. Within it we find a magnificent truth. One we should remember each time we taste the simple matzah bread each day of this extraordinary week of Pesach. And this wondrous truth is that in every single passage and place, everywhere there is affliction, there is also the presence of God. The presence of God in that his name is mentioned in every single context near the affliction. Even more amazing, every single context where there is the reality of affliction or misery, he's not just only there, but he is seen. And please know that just as Shema is not just hearing sounds, but rather listening with the intention to act upon what is being heard, so too when the Lord sees, he is not an idle bystander. No, he sees with the intent to act. We can see that clearly in the scriptures here. Hashem is seeing or acting or moving in some way every single place there is affliction. The Lord has given heed. Hashem has seen. Hashem has made lives fruitful despite affliction. Hashem has surely seen. Hashem delivers bringing a person up out of the affliction. And perhaps most importantly, in this context where we are introduced to this matzah as being the bread of affliction, we are given the very reason why Hashem has asked us to simplify things for a week of our life in order so that you should remember all the days of your life that you came out of Egypt. The verse doesn't say so that for all time people reading this should remember when this nation remote to them and other people in another time and place left their bondage. No, it says to us so that you should remember all the days of your life, the day when you came out of Mitzrayim, the day you, I, we came out of whatever we were held captive to, that which became idolatry to us, bondage, a boot on our necks. We should know that in experiencing this feast of Hashem, whatever it was that we decided, I love this more than anything else. Be it a child, a person, an idea, a practice, anything other than Hashem, that we must leave that behind. I don't mean desert your family, but this idea of this is, this, I love this, whatever this is, more than anything else. And without this, I'm incomplete. That's idolatry. We need to leave that behind because Hashem needs to be this. That we must banish from our borders, our boundaries, our gates our homes, our households, our lives, our hearts, forever and perpetually. This is why the feasts come year to year. So the Tekhina for Rosh Chodesh Nisan continues. Reading, though it is difficult to run their household with their incomes, and again, this is giving us the voice of the woman of the day, who these were their concerns. They nevertheless uphold your desires and observe your commandments. Therefore, dear God, send abundance and blessing to all the Jews and to all those who yearn for your Torah and protect us with your holiness so that we not stumble over prohibited leaven on Pesach. Invest. We spoke about planting now, last week, planting in these fields before the Pesach experience. Planting now, these swiftly hastening, waning weeks before Pesach, invest. Invest, invest time in your learning, in planning and preparing an atmosphere where there will be questions and awe and wonder and excitement and engagement and closeness. The meal itself doesn't have to be extravagant. Nothing does. The intent with which you put behind the thought is equivalent to the divine response. And in our prayer, what is this? Stumbling over leaven on Pesach? What is this that we're asking Hashem to protect us from? I couldn't help but think about the passages where Yeshua seems to be calling our minds to this idea, leavening, to beware, not to stumble in it. Of course, we literally are 
not to have any leavening in our possession, or at least, at the very least, to refrain from consuming it intentionally. But I think his words can help us draw deeper connections for this year. So Pam, if you will read that first verse for us, please. Mark 8, 15. And he, Yeshua, was giving orders to them, saying, Watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Thank you. So we have that reference to leavening. Yeah, so she was right here. Sorry, you know, you know, I think. Maybe that's where, but yeah, that's where we're at. She just read that verse. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Why the Pharisees and Herod? Why mention them both? Why does he do that? Well, they were in a relationship of convenience. The one party used the other party for whatever favor or assistance or control or power either might yield or wield for the benefit of the other. This is absolutely not the kind of relationships that we are attempting to foster, grow, recognize, facilitate, and become ever increasingly grateful for at this special time of thankfulness. Let us consider where any of our actions, our interactions with other human beings, with the people we call our friends, have become objects of convenience or abuse, God forbid, or usury. Is there anything disingenuous about our dealings with others? This is why he asks us to do a careful search, like we would do for Badika's comments the search for leavening. Yeshua emphasizes this point using language that this man, these men, his men, were supposed to relate to. However, they missed the point at first. Let us not miss the point. The leaven of the Pharisees was that their words and their stringencies and their seemingly going above and beyond were just that, words. The actions didn't line up with their judgments of others. They didn't practice what they were preaching. Is there anything about this inside of us? When we counsel someone in love and affection, making sure someone's suffering knows how valuable their lives are and how much we will know and how much we know that they can do it and become better and stronger and braver and accomplish everything they set their minds to. When we do that for others, will we treat our own self the same way? Or do we beat up on ourselves? You're not good enough. Nothing you do matters. You can't. You won't. Or... It isn't good enough. Don't do that to yourself. If you believe that loved one deserves your support, so do you. Or on the other hand, if, like this sect of Pharisees, we might have become self-righteous, unable to be wrong, having to have the last word, unmovable, prideful, unable to accept reproof, criticism, then we are caught in a situation where that leavening, like actual physical leavening, once it has been introduced to bread and it can't be taken out, it can take over and cause us to become set in our ways, entrenched, impervious to any scrutiny or change. And um, go ahead and have Sam, will you read that next section, please? Matthew 16, verses 6 through 12. And Yeshua said to them, Watch out and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. He began to discuss this among themselves, saying, He said that because we do not bring any bread. But Yeshua, aware of this, said, You men of little faith, why do you discuss among yourselves that you have no bread? Do you not yet understand or remember the five loaves of the five thousand, and how many baskets full you picked up? Or the seven loaves of the four thousand, and how many large baskets full you picked up? How is it that you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread? Thought beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood that he did not say to, to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. So, um, and again, that doesn't mean that he wanted them to beware of the Torah, or even to beware of the oral traditions or the stringencies, but the fact that they were not living by what they were saying. Um, but I love this section. I was kind of actually, I was laughing out loud reading this last night because when you read it, he said something and they they completely get it completely wrong and he immediately is like, you got it all wrong. 
you don't understand, you aren't paying attention, this is not what, and literally, I, this is not what I am, am talking about, and he's not, he's not um, handling them with kid gloves, I, I, it just made me very, it was endearing to me that he was so straight with them, but this is the point, first of all, he highlights the same idea of this searching for leaven and being where, of being ensnared by it like we had in our blessing, watch out and beware, Okay, and um, and as I said, so so these are things. I hope that that deepens that um, for you. The the kind of the commentary on um, how we're treating others is it matching up to what we would do for others? And I know each one of you has a heart for service and lifting up the other one, and I pray that you will learn to do that for yourself. That you can do that for other people. Can you do it for yourself? This is being where the leaven of the Pharisees to where you are actually applying what you are giving over to others to yourself because that's super important. And then just understanding, again, not to be like they were, impervious to any scrutiny or change, prideful and unmovable, having to have that last word. Things like this are the leaven we don't want to stumble over during Passover. It's not just about not eating bread at all. All right, so let's continue. Tachina for Rosh Chodesh Nisan continues reading. Let the sacred holiday of, it should say, Pesach come easily to us. Let us not, God forbid, be beholden to human beings for gifts. Help us to be able and willing to support needy householders so that they too have what is necessary to celebrate the sacred holiday. Let them not be ashamed. Amen. And Marina's back, and I know you're just listening in, but we um, had just gone through the Hebrew on um, this word for affliction, because if matzah is known as the bread of affliction, we wanted to understand that, and we're going through this concept from the prayer of not stumbling over matzah in the correct way to treat others and ourselves but maybe you can go back and, and listen to that because I want you to listen to that part Marina especially so so make sure you go back and check that out um, you do love yourself as much as you would love your children as much as you would love the others in your life that you bless and I can already tell that, that you're that kind of compassionate and empath of a person um, make sure that you're treating yourself with that same consideration because you do deserve it. Um, going on, Rabbi Moshe Iserles of 16th century Poland requires that the search for chametz include checking one's pockets. Isaiah Horowitz added an ethical dimension to this internal audit. Check carefully that your pockets contain no funds deriving from theft robbery, or fraud. That was really awesome to me. This is something new that I'm taking on this year. I am not taking this literally. I mean, yeah, literally, if I owe someone or if I, I can scan my financial dealings, I will do that. But but I think there's a really deep lesson here about preparing for Pesach and about turning out your pockets. So let's take a look. I think that this is a beautiful idea, this idea of turning out one's pockets as a way to spiritually clean heart and house. Is there anything inside that I am envious of in others, jealous of in another's life? These are crumbs. They must be disposed of. Is there anything that I am holding on to from my past that has not been properly dealt with, repented for, disposed of? Is there any debt that someone else has not paid me, that I'm clinging to that receipt, that transaction record in my pocket? Perhaps, since this is a season of my redemption, I can see my way to forgive those debts in kind. On a more practical level, to empty out the crumbs in my pockets, is there anything I promised or said I would do that I didn't do, that I can do and should do? Something I should follow through on and make it a goal and commitment to do so? Is there anything in my possession which I borrowed that I should I return that I should return? 
Is there anything I damaged that I should repair or repay? Do I have any outstanding debts? So these last two are important because it doesn't maybe have to do with property. Maybe it has to do with a heart that I damaged. Can I repair or repay that situation and any outstanding debts I may have? There are way are there ways I could and should be more generous? Are there ways I could or should rein in my spending and investments? Those previous two questions and ideas can apply to time and heart investment as well, or perhaps primarily, not taking them literally. Where can I be more generous with my affection or my giving um, where should I rein in certain expenditures that should be invested somewhere else? What love have I been holding back? What affection holding out on? Anything that I am dangling over anyone else? Let us be rid of any such things. Now is the time. Um, I think, is it, is Pam, you want to read that psalm? I don't remember who's turn it was. Sure. Psalm 69.1 Save me, O God, for the waters are up to my neck. I have sunk into my mire, into the miry depths, where there is no footing. I have drifted into deep waters, where the flood engulfs me. I am weary from my crying. My throat is parched. My eyes fail, looking for my God. Those who hate me without cause outnumber the hairs of my head. Many are those who would destroy me. My enemy, my enemies for no reason. Though I did not steal, I must repay. You know my folly, O oh God, and my guilt is not hidden from you. May those who hope in you not be ashamed through me. O oh Lord, God of hosts, may those who seek you not be dishonored through me. Oh, God of Israel. And so we have about 10 minutes until our this se session of the WebEx will expire. But sign back on. What I'm going to try and do is just do this within that amount of time. Actually, no, let's not do that. Let's sign out now. I'm sorry. Sign back in just so we don't have to rush. So I don't have to rush. And then we'll talk. I'll stop the recording and we'll talk about our questions. We'll have that full like half hour to do that. So, so go ahead and sign back in. Shabbat shalom. For the recording.
There's so many things that, that I'm hearing that just, I pick up on them and make me think really deeply about, you know, and I remember I keep, we went outside for my physical therapy and I remember thinking, wow, look at all the birds, that's cool. I didn't know it was that's Nissan. Awesome. I wish I had known that for you. So that was like, no, God is wonderful. Yeah. So you said it. You okay. said your own version of yeah. it. Yeah. I sure did. This is so pretty too, this blossom mm-hmm. there. All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started again. Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem, we're back with part three, depending on which video you're watching and which one I post. So um, again, we're learning, um, we are learning on March 12th of 2021. We are doing the Nissan, new month of Nissan blessings. Um, gratitude and emptying our pockets for Pesach and that is the idea that we just tackled really turning one's pockets out now literally we're talking about checking carefully that your pockets contain no funds and derived from theft robbery or fraud but we went a lot deeper than than that and we want to do that and I hope it was of value to you it is of great value to me to see where you're holding back when you shouldn't what debts you should forgive in order to be expected that forgiveness. Um, are there things you didn't follow through on that you should do? Again, ways that you're not giving affection or holding out, dangling anything over anyone else, all these things, or jealousy or envy in someone else's of someone else's life, holding on to your past, all these things are crumbs in your pockets. We need to turn those out and you can get rid of that comments before that leavening before Pesach read beautiful psalm and now we're going to pick back up to conclude I believe the yes I should have said concluding here the t- concluding the Tehina, the uh, prayer for Rosh Chodesh Nisan uh, master of the universe, we now bless the month of Nisan, during which we observe a holiday of Passover, so-called because you, God, passed over the houses of Israel when you passed through the land of Egypt and put to death all their firstborn. The Jews smeared the blood of the Paschal lamb on the lintel of the doorpost so that the destroyer would not have the permission to go into the house of the Jews. Thus may you scold all destroyers that they not come to the doors of our houses to do evil to us, Jews, or any of those who are called by your name, to our children, our grandchildren. Save our entire household from all evil and redeem us this month as you promised us. Behold, I have redeemed you as in latter times, as in earlier times, speedily in our days. Amen. Lord, we ask that you would guard the gateways, all the openings of our lives, lives, physically, our ears, our eyes, our mouths, and the cavities of our hearts, that they all would be clear of negativity, stress, self-hate, disappointment, discontent within ourselves, and perhaps especially with others, our kids, our spouses, our friends, our family. We know that the enemy and the evil inclination which he exploits in us would love to watch us undo ourselves because we've just not done it right or well or good enough, but that is not of you. Prohibit these forces from invading this special time of planting and preparing for Pesach. Friends, if you have time this week, read the Haggadah. And if you don't have one, you can find them online and I can give you those links. And if you want one and you can get together with me, I I can give you one to use. I have plenty, more than plenty, and they will not be missed and they will be much better used in your home than sitting on my shelf during Passover. Read it and think about its main themes and parts of all the very significant points to be made. What we come to is a night of emotion, which... Which, and I was going to say this too, that maybe for next week, God willing, pray for me, but 
I wanted to look at several of the themes that we haven't looked at in previous years. We've looked at some of the main elements, the matzah, the maror, the wine, I believe. But let's look deeper at, I wanted to, I've always wanted to look a lot deeper about the four sons and the four cups. So perhaps we'll do that, God willing, let's, let's pray on that. But let's, let's look at this idea. So, so we come to a night of emotion at the Seder, emotion. It should be all-inclusive. Which is the most predominant emotion at the Seder? What do you think? I mean, I, at the top of my head, I would think all, or I would think uh, maybe obedience, or I would think um, different things. But if we look closely at each element, it is easy to see that in each part, we have gratitude. We are remembering and identifying and thanking with each cup, each dip, each plague even that are remembered throughout the Seder, certainly something like the broken masa, the value of the promise of freedom being fulfilled. And that should evoke gratefulness more than anything else. The Hallel, those are the Hallelujah Psalms, the Berkat Hamasom, the um, blessing for, for after meals, the grace for after meals, all these things evoke and enlist and inspire gratefulness. So... Think about what you are grateful for in advance. Where nothing is left unfulfilled, where you can really take a step back and look at things the way they are and find thankfulness for the way that they are, not the way that you want them to be, not the way that they should be, but the way that they are. We mentioned the brush with death as being part and parcel, hand in hand with birth, with life. So is this Pascal lamb and its blood on the gates of our lives, indicative of a death which made way for our own security. It's a sign of obedience in more than just the blood swipe. We also follow through with the rest of the instructions, staying put when he said to stay put, being ready to go when he said go, and following him without having to, answer, to have an answer about where or when. He showed his gratitude for us, following him into the unknown by saying, forever is what it is with you and I. Sometimes it might feel like I'm making you wait forever for your miracle, but everything is a miracle. On the seventh day of Pesach, we walk through the walls of the split sea of reeds. This is the time frame of what was happening. Were the ten plagues hard, hard, difficult, challenging for God to do? Was the sea making a path for his people, like a challenge for him? Look at the butterfly closely, the tiny pinpricks of color coming together to make a mosaic, some no bigger than a fingernail in breadth, the entire creature. Look at a morning glory, wake up with the sun, or a field of grass become a flame with dew, and the sun's light reflecting. These intricacies that are miraculous take place every single day. That we are talking right now. That we have a thought and an action follows it. A kindness. These are miracles. Let us learn to appreciate this life and the time we have left. And with that thought. There are only two commandments that we can legally keep from the actual big biblical text. The blood on the doorpost was a one-time event. That is not to be repeated. The Paschal lamb is only to be offered in the Holy Temple in Jerusalem, which is not standing. To do anything of the like would be a great desecration, so we can't do that. Pre-Passover, we remove the leaven, and of course we rest, as we would on a weekly Sabbath on the appointed days of the feast. Um, and, and Sam can read this next section for us, which should solidify these rest days for us. Yep. Shemot Exodus. Oh, wait, by a graph. 23, 6. Then on the 15th day of the same month, there is the Feast of Unleavened Bread to the Lord. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall not do any laborious work. 
But for seven days you shall present an offering by fire to the Lord. On the seventh day is a holy convocation. You shall not do any laborious work. Okay, so we have pre-Passover, obviously, we're removing leaven. Um, the rest days go without saying that. There are just two commandments in regard to Pesach that we can keep once it is upon us. Just two. Eat matzah and talk to your family. And Pam, if you'll read those two for us, please. <laughs> Shemot 13.8 You shall tell your son on that day, saying, It is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt, and it shall serve as a sign to you on your hand and as a reminder on your forehead that the Torah of the Lord may be in your mouth. For with a powerful hand the Lord brought you out of Egypt. Therefore you shall keep this ordinance. As it appoint as its appointed time from year to year. Shemot twelve twenty five. When you enter the land which the Lord will give you, as he has promised, you shall observe this right. And when your children say to you, What does this right mean to you? you shall say, It is a Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the sons of Israel in Egypt, when he smote the Egyptians but spared our homes. You can see there that Hashem is, is not just hinting that we should be talking and having conversations. You should tell your son. This is part of the commandment. When your children ask you, you're going to answer them. Um, and it's not just about, you know, the kids. We need to find that childlike, as we talked about last week, um, inquisitiveness inside of each one of us. And to be willing to seek out those answers. So when we talked about this brush with death, truly being necessary for the rise, the, I spelled that wrong, the descent to bondage and pain, a part of the incredible exceeding of our expectations, which Hashem will perform for us in His time. Use it. Write a letter as if it were the last one you will ever write. Say the thing I could never say before. Act as if it is the last chance you'll ever have and emote from that place. Be candid, be present, be thoughtful, genuine, sincere, open, broken open, and share with your family, share with your friends. Truly in this world in which we live, we do not know anything, but we do have this. And so, and I have, I have plans to write y'all those letters. I have my papers here. I made this book for my kids. Everybody's got their own section. I printed out this little matzo paper because I wanted them to really identify with this idea. What if it's the last night we get to spend together? What did you want to say to your brother that you never got to say or won't ever get to say again? What do I want to say to my husband that I, do you know, type of things like that. It'll deepen the connection. It'll foster conversation. Um, you know, and who knows how deep the children get into it, but they'll always have this. God willing. So just an I just a thought. All right. So that's my, I mean, so I get morbid sometimes. Pretend like you're going to die. You're on your deathbed. You're walking to the gas chamber with your brother and, and you had time though to write this letter and you hand it to him before you reach that certain death. And the kids are like, okay, here we go again. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? And and so this brush with death, I pray, will be a seed for a new life of connection between them and, and, and a meaningful experience. So, the Israelites, after experiencing the miracle of the ten plagues and having known firsthand of God's covenant faithfulness to them, they still initial, initially balked at the command to follow Moshe into the sea. They failed to make, this is important, they failed to make a personal application of what they knew to be true, namely, that God was both able and willing to rescue them and to take care of them. They said they knew it, but they didn't think that was for them. They didn't think they were big enough or important enough. And this is something we, that's comments that we need to get out of our consciousness. The disciples then, like their forefathers, were those of little faith, Yeshua called them. 
because being captivated by their temporal concerns, they were unable to focus <laughs> on the eternal spiritual realities Yeshua was teaching them. They thought that he was talking about bread. Their faith was small because they were not applying to themselves, not applying to themselves what they knew to be true of Yeshua, i.e., that he could easily and adequately meet their temporal needs and that he had promised to do so. And, and this was Matthew. Um, if you want to look it up, Matthew 16, 9 through 11. We, we had read part of that section. He says, Do you not yet understand or remember the five loaves of the 5,000 and how many baskets full you picked up? This gratitude, right? Let's not forget about the things that he has done for us even when we feel like there's nothing to be grateful for. Adonai, we are all in need. We are needy and impoverished and longing for you, longing for your presence. We yearn to set a table where you are welcomed and central and beloved and honored. Please allow for our every effort to facilitate this in our lives and homes to be realized. Lord, how many times have you brought us to these seasons and we strive, and we stress, and we plan, and we feel perhaps we've not done well. And how many times have you shown us beauty, closeness, wonder, love, how many baskets you filled with your mercies and favors and grace. And yet, we ask for a sign, for a miracle, for answers, for reasons, for explanations, for responses to our prayers and indications and proof that you are who you say you are and will do what you have said you will do. Teach us gratitude, simplicity, sincerity, how to live redeemed. It was enough the price you paid, more than enough. You will exceed, you will exceed our expectations. Are we willing to follow you, even if it takes longer than expected, even if we don't see where you lead? So may it be. And whoever's next reading can read that last verse for us, please. All right. Yeah. Yermiyahu. I'm sorry, I'm not Jeremiah. sure the verse. I'll put the verse back in somehow. Sorry. Okay. Chapter two. Thus is the Lord, I remember concerning you the devotion of your youth, the love of your betrothals, your following after me in the wilderness, through a land not sown. Shabbat Shalom, Chodesh Tov, a good month to you, and happy Pesach planting. And stay online while I turn off my other videos. Hashem. Close that. I guess that was it. Oh, one more. Shabbat Shalom.